Witajcie w kolejnym programie z cyklu Zdolni, czyli DOL. DOL to my, dominikański ośrodek liturgiczny. Rozmawiamy z ludźmi, którzy gdzieś się natknęli na muzykę, weszli w teologię, zachwycili sztuką i o tym chcą opowiadać. Dzisiaj, po dwóch odcinkach poświęconych stricte muzyce dominikańskiej, Postanowiłem zaprosić gościa, którego nie widzicie, bo jestem sam w studio, ale mój gość jest tutaj w laptopie. Przez Zuma łączymy się z osobą, którą znam już prawie 9 lat, a poznaliśmy się, kiedy zacząłem moją pracę w Stanach Zjednoczonych Ameryki Północnej. Ta osoba to Julie Belfi, jest studentką na Uniwersytecie Notre Dame. To już kolejna przygoda z, ze światem Akademii. Julie studiuje teologię. I trochę nam o tym opowie. Opowie też o swoim spotkaniu z polskimi dominikanami, z polską muzyką liturgiczną i o tym, czym żyją młodzi teologowie w Ameryce. Zresztą zobaczymy, jak ta rozmowa się rozwinie. A teraz bez zbędnych tutaj wstępów chcę przerzucić się na język angielski, bo w takim języku ta rozmowa będzie prowadzona. A Was zachęcam do śledzenia napisów, które będą za chwilę. Well, Julie, I just told them all I know about you, all good things. Welcome to the studio. It's really good to have you with us today. Uh, well, I told them, Julie, that you study theology currently at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, so what do you study? What's theology in this kind of academic way? Tell us about your life as a theology student. As a theology student? Yeah. Um... Well, I study, there's lots of different ways that you can study theology. There's lots of different um, concentrations within my own program. So I study liturgy. And I think first and foremost, mm -hmm. uh, I study theology by coming to the Lord in prayer and by um, accessing the sacraments and the liturgy. That's the first and foremost way that I Uh, study God that I know him in the way that he is revealed to us in his right. creation and in the mass and in the prayers that we pray um, and in my relationship with him. So I, I think primarily uh, that's where I try to base a lot of my understanding. Um, but then also I study a lot. I read a lot of theologians. <laughs> I study the history of um, rites and of the liturgy and Um, man, I study art sometimes, um, the human experience of interacting with God and the ways in which God has made himself manifest um, in our world. I, would, I guess that's kind of how I would sum up some of what I do uh, in academic theology. Well, and you are just completing your master's, which is a two-year program, and you were accepted to a full PhD program beginning next fall, so congratulations. But It sounds like you really like what you do. Now, uh, tell us more about liturgy as a, as a personal kind of love story, because I, I know you, I know you wouldn't do this if you were not in love with this subject. So, so why liturgy? Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that you call it a love story, because it, it feels like you're asking me to um, explain why I love someone. Uh, and how do you explain why you love someone? You might point to like this little thing or that little thing, but it never encompasses fully how I feel about um, the liturgy. Right. I mean, I, I came to it through personal experience, um, through encountering the liturgy and being enthralled by it. Um, and also just not understanding it, not understanding some of the different liturgical battles that happen um, within the church and wanting to have more of a sense of what the liturgy really is. I think that I've become grounded a little bit more in that as I've done my master's degree. But um, in the process of that, I found all of these other aspects of liturgy that I find um, interesting, but beautiful and like worthy of our time and our effort as uh, academic theologians. And so, um, yeah, I, I think the beauty of the liturgy, the mystery of the liturgy, um, the way in which humanity is wrapped up in it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, all of salvation history is uh, the story of God being made manifest in the lives of humans. And liturgy is the way in which that, um, that humans 
uh, enact the theology that they believe and that they profess. We go to the liturgy and we're, we're, um, we're enacting the creed that we believe. We're saying, this is the way that I believe that the Lord is here present with me. And I'm trusting that he is asking me to come and give all of myself to him um, in this way and to encounter him. And so that's really fascinating to me. Um, not just that God is coming to us, but that we are responding to him and that he desires the human response um, in liturgical worship, this communal response. Uh, yeah. Well, is that is the <laughs> give us, it is amazing and I can listen to it over and over again but um, well liturgy theology that was not your first pick in college uh, tell us about your story a little bit um, well I don't know if it's not too much to ask but are you a cradle Catholic have you always believed have you always practiced has it always been obvious for you that Christianity is the thing the right kind of, you know, human response to the mystery of life? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I was raised Catholic. I have wonderful, beautiful parents whom you've met. And um, I have. Uh, they, yeah, they're just lovely. I have a big Catholic family um, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, eventually, the, the area that surrounds me is not very Christian or Catholic. And so I think that um, in trying to raise us in the faith, there were some questions that like just weren't answered by the way that I lived my life. It didn't quite make sense. Things didn't fit together. I think I was very, um, uh, hung I was hungering for more, um, something that uh, actually expressed what I was living out, but where I was, I was living out Mm -hmm. um, life in a culture that, that wasn't Christian. And so I think that it was actually very difficult for me to internalize uh, the gospel and to understand um, how the law of the Lord uh, actually corresponded to the life that I was living. And so I fell away from the faith um, towards end of my high school years and um, into college. And eventually I came back through um, actually uh, the church's, like a, a discovery of the church's teaching on sexuality and sexual morality, I found John Paul II's Theology of the Body. And it really spoke into my experience, not just, um, yeah, it, it Which felt you, as if- You um, know, you and I have talked about this whole JP2 Theology of the Body and how he is making a huge impact on many people in uh, America, but here in Poland, his teaching is not really uh, known. That specific kind of piece of his his uh, teaching, and uh, so I'm I'm glad that you mentioned it. I'm glad that you mentioned your own encounter and how that felt kind of liberating, I guess, challenging, but also like I guess organizing your your longing into uh, putting some words into it, right? or showing some possible direction. Absolutely. Yeah, I, when mm -hmm. I read Theology of the Body, it felt like this is exactly what I'm experiencing. This explains uh, the way in which I find sex beautiful, but also I find it um, that something's wrong about the way that I'm doing it. Something like isn't placed in the way that it should be. And right. I think through that exploration of the, the church's sexual morality, I actually came to understand other aspects of the church better too, and to fall in love with those aspects of the church. Um, for example, like I became enthralled with the Eucharist and understanding like what it is that union, the fullness of union is meant to look like, the Eucharist made more sense to me um, after learning about uh, how God created sex, which is just like such a, an interesting- It's a crazy gateway <laughs> into the whole sense. Eucharistic mystery, right? But it's an amazing one. It's a powerful, tangible way to, uh, to experience the power of God's love, right? Um, so that was like a turning point for you. And uh, that's kind of the time we met. But well, this whole interview is not about us and uh, the stuff we've done, but uh, this is kind of about how you discovered the, uh, I guess the attraction of, of theology and art and liturgy. So when you went to college, you first studied nursing, right? That was your first kind of idea for who you should be in life. Uh, what happened that you didn't graduate with that degree? Why did you change your mind? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a long story. I'll try and I'll try and give it in just a little snippet. And of course, I know how I, it ended. I know it ended with art history, and that led you to God's beauty. And I kind of want to hear more about that. So, so not only myself, but people who listen to us, they also get a little bit of that that journey. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I. So I started studying nursing, and I think that the only reason that I was studying it um, was that people told me that I'd be good at it, and that also um, I knew it was very practical. I know that I, I knew that I could get a job anywhere um, with this degree. But as I and I, I actually was very interested in it. The human body is super interesting to me. But um, yeah, being engrossed in it, I realized actually, and looking back now, I can I can realize that like actually what I wanted to do is teach, <laughs> which is just so funny. But um, uh, anyway, um, after my conversion and coming back to the church, uh, I think that there was um, I was like learning to to properly order uh, different things in my life, like um, first off sex, but then all of these other things. Uh, as I engaged um, the teachings of the church and came into my faith uh, as an adult and on my own, I started to recognize the things that were really important to me. Mm-hmm. And the, not just important to me, but in the ways that the, the Lord um, has like ordained them to be in our lives and to place him before all of the other things that um, were, guys, I guess, like just in the right context. Um, and in doing that, I found that uh, there was a, an immense freedom in allowing my own passions and my own joys to organize um, my life as well and to, to play a role in them. I'd always loved art, um, but I had never thought that that was something that I could study because it wasn't practical. It wasn't going to get me a job. And right. so uh, in this, um, as I, I discovered the Lord and that like he has a, a desire for the way that he's created me, um, I kind of lived into that a little bit. I kind of pushed back against the desires and the um, uh, the push of our culture, my own culture, um, to be productive and to, to uh, give back to society in a very particular way that creates money. <laughs> um, I, uh, I started to approach my own academics as a way that I could find an expression of myself. And part of that was in beauty and art. Um, and so with a little exploration, I found art history to be this really uh, profound way that I could uh, both look at history, which I found that I was really interested in, and then also look at um, the way in which uh, cultures have have expressed themselves artistically throughout history, which is the best way to study history. If you're going to study it, you might as well study the ways that people have been creative throughout histories, the things that they've drawn and uh-huh. <laughs> the beauty that they've um, espoused uh, during different times in the world. But then the, the cool thing that happened at the same time as like my budding um, understanding of myself uh, was in work. Also, my my um, my own faith life was also budding. And so there was this really awesome way in which studying art in a Western context is also studying theology because all of the art uh, throughout the Western history is based in theology totally. um and so as i'm i'm studying art i'm also getting to read thomas aquinas and uh how he understands angels and i'm getting to look at caravaggio and and understand the way that western um the western culture has understood uh personhood and um different kinds of theology and so this also led to not just an appreciation of art but also an appreciation of the theological tradition of western the western church so, oh, and then yeah. I found Byzantium, which was just really cool. <laughs> I, love it. I had no idea that there was an Eastern church <laughs> at this time. I was 22 and I had no idea that there was like a whole other side of the church that had this beautiful history as well. So I, I guess, I don't know if that answers your question, but I could talk about these things for a very long time. Mm-hmm. I know you would be great at talking about this stuff for hours and that could be a different series that one day, who knows if the pandemic continues. <laughs> And the stay-at-home order continues, which we don't want to happen, but we may come up with another series. <laughs> now, for the purpose of this little conversation, I kind of want to take it in that kind of direction of, um, well, what you some, somehow mentioned, your, your, your fascination with the tangible and the real 
that is somehow, you know, embodied in humanity, in the human body, right? The fact that uh, your discovery of theology was not just a purely academic, abstract, sort of intellectual journey, but it was about your own personal growth and your question about love and, and friendship and uh, how you express your your desire for, for love and whatnot. And then art history, well, with the nursing episode. Again, the humanity, that mystery of... Well, I don't think you've mentioned incarnation, but what you've been saying is very kind of incarnation-centered. Would you, would you agree? Uh, but Absolutely. Then, <laughs> you know, one, one part of your journey, uh, the one that I was also involved with, uh, so I have some vivid memories of, um, of that experience, is campus ministry. And I kind of want you to tell us a little bit about what it is to be a, a lay person, a lay young woman who has a desire to serve the church. And uh, what was it like for you being a, a campus minister? Yeah, I guess um, a follow-up question is, uh, would you like me to talk about as a college student or as a, a professional Actually, campus minister? Both. I did campus ministry in both. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, during my conversion, one of the aspects of it was that um, I had felt, uh, yeah, the, the call to, um, to serve in the church in a particular way, which uh, was called peer ministry, that it was an opportunity at the college that I went to and that Father Lukash was um, ministering at. And um, it was an opportunity to give a year of service to the church as a university student. So um, we ended up putting on retreats for people, um, for stu our fellow students. We put on Bible studies. We started just things that um, would serve the population of university students. And um, yeah, it, I wasn't paid to do it. Um, and I think that's kind of something that's normal within our university systems is that undergrad students won't be paid to do it, but they'll, they'll give of their time mm -hmm. and effort to ministering to their fellow students which I think is actually a very effective way to minister, um, working alongside with uh, priests and clergy. But um, it's really effective to, I think, to have people your own age who are experiencing things at the same time as you to uh, witness to the way that God's working in their life and to kind of work through some of the same things. You haven't, none of you have mastered that stage of life, but to do it together and to find ways um, to, to, enliven the faith of other people. That's kind of how I see um, campus ministry uh, functioning. Also, it gives, I think, lay people the sense that the faith is their own and that the faith is something that they need to, to take and, to, and that they're responsible for, um, for the evangelization process, for bringing the faith to other people. Um, so that was kind of my experience as a college campus minister. Uh, I did it for a year um, formally, and then for another two years after that, um, not informally, but like in a, in a different way. I didn't live at the church at that time. Um, and then I kind of was thinking that I wanted to go to grad school after this point, but was invited by uh, our dear father, Lukash, to um, <laughs> be a professional campus minister in Utah. So uh, he moved out there and then I moved out there um, to help start a program. Um, kind of in the middle of nowhere in uh, a totally different environment than we had been ministering in. Um, and to really build a program where there were not very many Catholics, uh, which is a totally different challenge on its own. What can I tell you about campus ministry in the professional sense, I guess? Well, you know, I'm sort of hoping for uh, some stories or some uh, experiences you could share with us about how liturgy and prayer, or perhaps the liturgical life that we were trying to create, or, uh, see, we, you, you don't create liturgy, right? <laughs> it's, it's not your own thing to create, but in a sense, creating opportunities for our students to experience that beauty of uh, the church's liturgy. In my own memories of that time, I think the liturgy is what really uh, allowed our young people, our students, to 
discover the, the, the depth of the Catholic life. So what was it like for you, someone who just graduated from college uh, in a new place? Uh, one of the, the layers of this question is also related to what I'm doing now, namely running the whole Dominican Liturgical Center here in Poland. And back then, it was like five years ago, we were trying to bring some Polish Dominican music to Utah. And for you, that was also kind of a new language of, of liturgical music, I guess. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that part of your experience. Yeah, I guess two things that I'm thinking off of right off the bat based on the last thing you said is just that um, my experience with liturgy, uh, I, yeah, before coming to college, I don't think I was very involved in the liturgy. It wasn't something that um, was important to me or something that I was, I, it was something that I participated in because I had to, but there was no sense of like, this is uh, something profound that anything here is happening. It's just a bunch of people gathering together with the priest is what it felt like. Um, and I think in college, just coming to a better understanding of the Eucharist along with my own conversion um, and like uh, a recognition of the power of beauty um, and of encountering the Lord in the liturgy, um, yeah, I just came to, to recognize, um, yeah, just what we have in the liturgy, what we've been given in the liturgy and how beautiful and, um, how it's such a hidden treasure of the church. I think, I think many people realize it, but in my life, I hadn't re recognized it. Um, I also started praying the liturgy of the hours with Dominicans, um, in, uh, Washington. And I think that that was part of, um, my deep love for the liturgy too, just a recognition of like, Oh, we can pray the Psalms with the church. Like this is a thing that we do profoundly together and profoundly unified, not just the Psalms, but, um, the mass as well. We live into that together and we bring our whole selves to the Lord, but also we bring other people with us and it's, it's a communal action that we do together. And so that was something that I found. It was like, one of the most unifying things to recognize that it's not not just the, the body here on earth christ's body here but like also the heavenly body that, that is all raising one joyful song to the lord of thanksgiving and praise anyway all of that is to say my liturgical experience because of father lukash was wrapped up in this beautiful music that was brought to us um and so my experience with falling in love with the liturgy is like inherently kind of meshed with this kind of style that's very simple. I have not been musically trained. Um, I have loved to sing, but like entering into anything that was like um, probably polyphony or something uh, a little bit more fancy would have been difficult for me. But this very meditative, um, contemplative kind of music, I think really colored the way that I see the liturgy and the encounter that I had. This like, there's a solemnity to it yeah. The fire truck. <laughs> I know that's the real life. And you right. want life happening. incarnation. <laughs> that's right. It all happens <laughs> right here. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, just having having the opportunity to really like um, encounter the Lord in this kind of um, solemn, contemplative, beautiful way, uh, meditative way. Uh, I just had no experience with before. Um, mass was in and out and, uh, yeah, in my childhood. And so this was just a way to kind of dwell with the Lord. And I think that that's actually something that our world is really yearning for. Mm -hmm. Um, I've experienced that often, um, especially on college campuses that like, it's very difficult to take time away because you're so busy with all of the things that you need to be doing with the productivity that you need to be continually living into. Um, you need to, you know, get more, um, I have no idea if this is relevant for uh, Polish listeners, but here I think in, in the university system, we're often driven by filling out our CV and making sure that we have the right internships. And it's just a continual grind of like um, doing everything uh, and doing it super well. And taking the time to dwell with the Lord, it's um, it can be a difficult thing and I, I think that this kind of meditative music um, really allows students and the, the prayers, the rhythm 
that we get into with the life of with the liturgical life is something that like is profoundly um, human, profoundly healing, and like very needed in our culture. Um, it's needed in every culture, but just particularly, I think, right now in the hustle and bustle of our lives. Yeah, um, I think it's a globalized Western thing, you know. Uh, so the, the the Polish listeners probably can relate to this as well. But um, so that was a couple of years ago. That was your experience with um, entering deeper into that understanding of the Mass and understanding of the liturgy. Well, now you are more a professional, right? After two years of studying it and with the prospect of doing it for another three or four and getting your PhD and probably teaching uh, in the academia, right? So uh, has anything changed, Julie? Has anything kind of shifted or just deepened, developed? Tell us about your perspective now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> I know, it's a tough one. Well, <laughs> <laughs> what has changed? I mean, the capacity of um, the way that I minister has changed, I think. As a professional, lay professional minister, I think my job was to create, um, to create encou- like um, moments for encounter with the liturgy. So whether that was just bringing students into um, some sort of like, uh, prayer service or some sort of encounter with the mass in which they could connect with beauty in a particular way, Um, bringing them to adoration, bringing them out actually into nature so that they could see this like kind of uh, unpredictable way that God is um, made manifest in our lives. Which in Utah and Washington state, you can totally do. Yeah, it's like 10 minutes away from your house and you're like in the middle of it. And it's like, oh, yes, I can see God is bigger than me. He's here. (laughs) This is beautiful. Um, Yes. In uh, South Bend, that's not always the case, though it is beautiful right now. So, um, yeah, but I think that so my capacity for ministry now is is very changed. It's not um, I'm not really creating the encounter uh, that I used to try to create for students. I'm more looking into, um, yeah, there's there's different ways in which we study liturgy. We study the history of liturgy um, so that we can understand the context um, that different liturgical changes happened in. Um, that helps us better understand like what's essential to the liturgy and what is uh, actually just something that was added because in that particular culture, uh, it spoke um, the reality of the liturgy to those people. Um, so we study that, um, and that helps us understand what's essential now for the liturgy and what um, what kinds of cultural things are appropriate to the liturgy and appropriate appropriately um, not just brought in, but like uh, effective at communicating um, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ into our lives right now. Um, so I study that I study, um, I, yeah, I study different ways in which enculturation happens. Um, I mean, that's all about incarnation. That's all about how not just Christ was incarnate 2000 years ago, but like he's incarnate right now in his church, in his body and doing things in the world. Um, and so to be able to, to kind of in an academic way, study that, not just, um, through people I know, but also through different, like studying cultures and studying, um, yeah, st- studying different manifestations of God. Uh, I do a lot of study of saints, which is really fun. Um, it's really interesting. And it's, to me, it's really fascinating uh, how much God uses our culture um, and uses our own communication to communicate himself, to reveal himself to us and his presence, his abiding presence with us. Well, you know, Um, it sounds like liturgy in that kind of view with the approach you've been presenting, well, liturgy is more than just mass or lauds or vespers. (laughs) It sounds like liturgy is really everything. So everything becomes part of that uh, communication of the divine and human response. And uh, obviously... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm writing a paper right now. I'm thinking about this very, uh, very hard because 
often we want to confine liturgy in the sacraments to um, the liturgy, mass, and the sacraments. But in the way, um, in, in our coming to the liturgy and the sacraments, we're formed into a way of viewing the world. And that way of viewing the world is to see Christ's manifestation, um, not just of his, the, the fact that he created everything, but also that he's redeemed everything and elevated all of it into his glorious divine life, uh, Trinitarian life, Trinitarian unity. And so I'm, I, this is just wonderful, I think, because I, I do think that the literature <laughs> itself is very important, but it, beca it becomes a way in which um, we can see the entire world. We can see everything that we do as a manifestation of God's presence in, uh, in our lives. Amen. It's, it's Amen. Living. <laughs> well, <Sacramental living. laughs> you know, this is a perfect way to finish this episode. Julie, the conversation should continue and I hope one day you'll be here in Krakow. You were supposed to be here this summer, but unfortunately we all know what happened and uh, the the workshop, the Extraordinary Music Workshop that Julie was planning on attending is postponed a little bit to 2021. Uh, but I'm really happy that we have this chance to chat. Also, your university, the University of Notre Dame, uh, especially the Liturgy Center and Dr. Tim O'Malley, they've become somehow involved with what we do here in Poland. So uh, our listeners here will hear more from different folks from Notre Dame and uh, this is a great collaboration for, for us here in Krakow. So Julie, thank you again for being with us. Uh, Godspeed with all your papers and all the finals. Uh, I'm gonna switch back to Polish. So thanks again. God bless thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's our pleasure. And uh, dla wszystkich was wielkie dzięki. Jeśli dotrwaliście, to gratulacje. Uh, polecamy się w przyszły czwartek. Będziemy z wami. Szczęść Boże. <laughs>